Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistle Geek Martial Arts Radio, episode 569. Today, Andrew and I are talking about developing a martial arts curriculum. What's involved? What do you need to know? What do you need to not do? Well, we're going to talk about at least some of it because it's a big topic. Speaking of big topics, you know what else is a big topic? Whistle kick, because we do a whole bunch of things. How's that for a segue that I just ruined? And if you want to see everything that we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find all the things that we're working on, various websites and projects and online content. There's a ton of stuff. And we share it all with you, the traditional martial artists of the world, because, well, we love martial arts. We want you to love martial arts. And if you already love martial arts, we want you to continue loving martial arts. Now, this show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got transcripts and videos and links and photos and all kinds of stuff for all the episodes we've ever done. And looking at my notes, I got completely derailed. Oh, yeah. And if you want to support us, <laughs> this is why after close to 600 shows, I still need some notes. See, I told you, Andrew, I get distracted. <laughs> If you want to support us, if you want to help us out, you could make a purchase, you could leave a review, you could buy a book on Amazon, you could tell a friend. In fact, I, I would love for people to tell people about what we're doing because we're trying. We're working really hard here. And if you really, really want to help, you could support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon is a place you give us money and we give you more content. The more money you give us, the more money we give you back. And it's a... It's a great way for you to support the creators, of the world that you value, and hopefully you value us. And if you don't, well, you're probably not listening or watching. And watching, yes, because this one's in video on YouTube. All right. Developing a martial arts curriculum. Um, I just write down everything that my instructor taught me and do that, right? Done. End, yep, okay. end, of, end of episode. Nice episode. Have a good day, Jeremy. Yeah, take care. Bye. <laughs> Obviously not. Obviously, it's so much more complex than that. Because how do you define the endpoint of a curriculum? I know a bunch of stuff. Some of the stuff I know came from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If I was teaching a karate program, do I teach the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu stuff? Do I have to teach the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu stuff? I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that leads into a great discussion point, which... At what point is a style not a style? I myself have uh, extensive knowledge of show, you know, not knowledge training in Shotokan, mm -hmm. and I'm now doing a lot of Shorinru, and I have done a decent amount of Gojiru as well. If I were to create a new system, no, I don't want to say system. That bad, bad word. If I was to create a curriculum, mm -hmm. at, like, like I'm going to open up my note, a, a brand new martial arts school here in Keene, I would sit down and figure out how what I'm going to teach some of the stuff I teach is going to be Shotokan because I have a lot of experience in that but a decent amount is going to be Shorinru and I could see there being some Gojiru in there too at what point do I say this isn't any style it's yeah. a bunch of different styles this is where for me I don't understand the fervor that comes up with styles and keeping things true because here's the thing i started in karate kind of a mixed style of karate primarily uh kyokushin and ishinru and then i went to taekwondo the way i approach do even think about taekwondo is different than the way someone who did not have that karate experience even in the same school, even taught by the same instructor. When I stepped into Kempo, the way I saw Kempo, the way I saw Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, all of the things that I've done in my life, even the things that aren't martial arts, impact the way I see and do any of my martial arts. So to say that, okay, we need to keep it true, we need to keep it historically accurate, I can understand the purpose, but I think you can only go so far. Absolutely. And, and at this point is because so many different styles are influenced by other styles and practitioners now are 
on a much higher basis, uh, but much higher statistical probability these days than 50 years ago, training in multiple different yeah. styles is at what point is everything we're doing MMA? And I don't mean, I don't mean UFC MMA, but like a blended a mixed martial arts, martial arts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and I agree. I agree because here's the thing I would guarantee even in the most traditional of schools, there's some technique taught some way or done in sparring that might not be historically accurate. And instead of trying to beat that out of people, I think recognizing that it's, it's okay and important. I think that's the first step in developing a curriculum is what are the things that are important to you and where are you going to create space for the individualization of the people training? Because you know what, Andrew, you and I, we can learn the exact same stuff from the same person at the same time, and we're going to do it differently. I'm not going to do a forum the same way you are. We're not going to spar the same way. Yep. It's just not going to happen. And if an instructor tries to force us to, one, at least one of us, probably both of us, is not going to have a good time. Yep, absolutely. And if your martial arts curriculum forces people out the door, it's not a very good one. <laughs> Yeah, you're just I, kind of I, defeating the purpose of, I think of having the curriculum. Yeah, I think that's rule one. There has to be, the curriculum has to be something that people are going to both learn from and in some way find enjoyment from. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And and I also think what, as we're going through this process, I think whether it's available to the students or not, I think it makes a difference to have it written down. I think you as the instructor teaching should have, it shouldn't be nebulous. It shouldn't be uh, in my, and this is, again, this is my opinion. I don't think it should be, uh, I think you're ready for yellow belt and you should have it. I think there should be a rubric, at least a general guideline of when you learn these things, you you are eligible to test for your next rank. And when you know these things, then you're ready for your next rank. And we could argue whether it should or should not be but not argue discuss whether it should or should not be available to the students to be able to look at um i think i could see it go either way i think there is a benefit for the students to be able to say okay this is what i need to understand before i can test mm -hmm. but i also understand there being a uh you know we will let you know when you're ready and you know i will teach you in this order but i do think it should be written down i don't think it should be uh, a gray area for you as the instructor i, I agree and when I think of the various martial arts schools I've participated in and even had myself, the I think what was most successful was having the core things written down, you know, in order to progress to this rank, you've got to learn these techniques, this form, demonstrate proficiency in this skill. But that wasn't the entirety of what was taught. Absolutely. Yep. That I agree. There was room for flexibility and bringing in other techniques um here's a great example let's say let, let's take a, a a form that shows up all over the place uh nahanshi or, or teki shodan exists not only in just about every well every karate style i've ever learned but there's a variant in taekwondo and for those of you who may not recognize those names it's often referred to as the wall form the one that you can be done with your back to a wall and you just move laterally I can see value in teaching that form. Let's say it's required for, I don't know, some kind of mid rank blue belt. Let's say you've got to learn that for blue belt. I can see at red belt or black belt or whatever level teaching a different version of that form, not because they need to memorize it, but because it shows them, hey, here's a different way of looking at that. Mm -hmm. And that different information might resonate. It might help them see things in the same way that if you've been a martial arts instructor for a while, you've probably seen that different teaching strategies work for different people. Yep. We sometimes, did a great episode on it. Yep. Sometimes bringing in a different instructor to teach the exact same thing in a slightly different way reaches different people. So creating that space for people to have some variance at least enhances understanding. Yeah, absolutely. So whether or not it's written down, it should be codified. I agree. What else do we have to think about with with a, a curriculum? Um, 
do you create a separate curriculum for kids than you do for adults? Mm. I can see as, as we're fond of saying, I can see it varying depending mm -hmm. on who you are and what's important to you. Yep. I was raised. No, that your standards are your standards. My original school didn't have junior ranks and the only exceptions that were carved out had nothing to do with knowledge or understanding. It was for, uh, I guess we'd call it maturity life experience. Yep. You know, um, there's a difference between an eight-year-old blue belt asking to go to the bathroom five minutes into class and a 38-year-old blue belt asking to go to the bathroom five minutes into class. <laughs> yeah. Right. Doesn't mean you say no or yes to one versus the other, but <laughs> there's a difference there, right? The, the, the ability yeah, sure. to be prepared for a class is, is in theory, uh, stronger for the older person. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you? What would, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I, I think it absolutely, the, the age of the student can make a difference in what isn't, isn't, I don't want to say appropriate, but uh, expected or, or not expected. Um, I, I do think if you are, if you are going to have a large, kids class like a, a big program i mm -hmm. think there's something to be said for having a separate curriculum for them because it's um it is understandable to have let's say i'm just going to pick a random number 10 mm -hmm. you know in order to get your first rank you have to learn these 10 to 15 things mm -hmm. uh a six-year-old is going to have a much harder time learning those 10 to 15 things, remembering and keeping in their head those 10 to 15 things, as opposed to, you know, an 18 year old or a 20 year old or 30, whatever. Right. Um, and so I think if, if, if a large portion of your school is going to be a kid's class, I think also, like you said, it's, de it's situationally dependent. It you know, depends on what you, you plan to do. Uh, if you don't plan to have much of a kid's class, well, then you don't have to really worry about it that much. Here's another example. I will teach a, I don't know, adult, even on their first day, not that I, I would, but I could, self-defense that might involve ripping someone's throat out or at least trying or, you know, crushing the larynx, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't care what rank they are. I'm not teaching a six-year-old that. Nope. Why? Because six-year-olds like to try things. They like <laughs> to try things on the dog. They like to try things on their younger sibling and they like to try things on the playground. Yep. And they don't have the life experience to understand that crushing their friend's larynx is different than when we spar in class. Do I remove it from the curriculum entirely because it's not appropriate for everyone? Maybe. Depends on how I view curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What else? And so, oh, no, no. I, I mean, I was, I was going to say, I, you know, we, we, I think we've codified the major things. Okay. You know. Yeah. So I thought we could have a discussion on if Jeremy Lesniak were to create a open up a new school tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What what would it look like? What would what would your curriculum? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean a hundred percent specifics. I would sure. le learn this technique or whatever. But you know, I thought we could have a, a a short discussion on what each of us would do. It's a great idea. I think the biggest difference for me versus what a lot of people would would do is that mine would be incredibly simple and have far less to learn than most people would do. When I was in my twenties, I was like, "All right, I'm going to teach all these karate forms and all these karate forms." and these other karate forms and i'm going to make a form out of capoeira so people can do it. and i was just it was just heaping information on top of information yeah and when i had my school it was only for two years but when i had my school there was a lot I, I went over a ton of information but here i am now um 20 years later and i would probably have three five seven forms mm -hmm. i would have what I would call a very simple curriculum that allowed people to adapt. I think that as I've gotten older and spent more time training, I'm, I'm more interested in concepts and philosophy around training mm -hmm. rather than 
learning this new stance and this new form because I can apply different concepts to the same form and get very different results. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you can learn those concepts without a great deal of specific training and specific techniques. And I think I just saw flash across social media the other day, uh, one of the quotes that, that we've got on our, our list. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, yes, I've written all these quotes, but I don't run our social media. So it's just as weird, if not weirder for me when I see my name come across <laughs> social media as it is for anybody else. Um, we use techniques to learn our concepts and then our concepts lead to the techniques that we do. But it's really hard to learn concepts, martial arts concepts, without doing a whole bunch of things and finding what they have in common and kind of figuring that stuff out for yourself. So I, my curriculum would have enough information in it for people to start drawing conclusions and understanding themselves, but not so much information that they don't have the ability to train and train things that interest them that might be outside. I've seen people that, you know, they, they go to test for a new rank and they've got five new forms. That's too many. Yep. It's, it's too many. It's, they're going to put the same amount of time into learning those forms. Why dilute it out? What would you do? Um, I would, first off, because I have background in Goju-ryu, Shorin-ryu, and Shotokan, I would likely, be, because, okay, back up. You use the word concept a lot. For me, it's the same thing, but I use the word principle. Like I'm, I'm teaching principles. Um, and I see value in different kata from different systems. Yep. So, um, you know, the, you, you mentioned uh, Naihanshi kata, you know, that, that, that principle of working, you know, laterally it, and understanding how to do that is a great principle. So I would likely use a couple of kata from each of those styles systems mm -hmm. um like you i would probably only have seven five to seven kata um i would likely have a 10 ranked q system or uh, you know under under black belt 10 10 ranks and i've thought that i would probably every other rank you would learn a a single kata so your first rank you learn a kata whatever that one is and then for your next test, you would learn the application for that kata. Mm -hmm. And then your next rank, you learn a new kata. And then your next rank, you learn the application for that kata. Learning and working specifically on learning principles. And, and I would choose kata that specifically teach different principles. You know, this kata, uh, you know, works on moving linear, uh, linear, linearly. Well, that is a hard word to say. Linearly. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, and this other kata may work more on working angles and and throws and whatnot, but it would be that's that's kind of the what I would look at and sure. to help understand how those principles work as they got into the later ranks, like the eighth and ninth rank. You know, just before getting to their black belt, I would absolutely have some some things on there where they would have to demonstrate and come up with their own techniques based on the kata so they have to start thinking how how can i apply this principle rather than being told how to apply this principle yeah i like it one of the things i've advised people you know once they've been training for a while i, I think it's a great mental exercise it doesn't mean you have to open your own school it doesn't mean it has to be uh you know, the, the spark that makes you leave your current training environment but i think if you've been training for 10 15 years you have your own thoughts on what a curriculum might look like and i think it's a wonderful wonderful thing for you to do because it's a great way to better understand your own values in the martial arts and the techniques that you find to be important yeah i would agree yeah we're certainly not advocating you know, leave your school and go start your own, but we're just, everybody has their own school with zero students. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be terrible. I'm sure someone's going to, if, if we, if this ever goes really big and we get famous enough to have lots of haters, someone will go back and cut that, that clip and, and make it seem like I'm advocating that. <laughs>
But I hope we get that big someday. That'd be great. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Uh, anything else we want to add before we wind down here? No, no I don't think so. Okay. It, it's, it, it's, again, I've said it a lot. I say it a lot on the show. It's simple, but it's not easy. A good curriculum, I think, is simple because it's a guideline. It's a reference. It's what you use as an instructor to inform what you're teaching. But it doesn't mean... If, think about it as a book. It doesn't mean you go you don't go off book from time to time. Oh, ab- absolutely. I was going to mention something very similar. Like just because you have the curriculum is written down doesn't mean that you can't alter it if you as 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 you continue through your school. You may you may write out your curriculum and two years into it realize you know what this isn't working and you can change it. That's okay. The the best musicians if you go to their concerts multiple times it's not the same show each time. In fact, each song isn't identical they'll they'll make adjustments they'll change timing i could make the same case for a curriculum it's there it's a reference point it's a goal post it's a foundation to lean on whatever you want to call it but a good foundation gives you the ability to launch from to yep. move in and around all right if anybody has feedback if you've done this exercise if you've developed your own curriculum if you've been part of a school with no curriculum or terrible curriculum or whatever, if you have thoughts on curriculum, we want to hear them. Best way, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I'll make sure Andrew sees it. And already we've had a few people write in some questions, some comments, and it's been great. So please keep that up. If, if you want to do so privately, we don't share it. If you just email us, that's not going public. Anytime we talk about or bring forward a topic that someone wrote to us, it's either done anonymously or they were totally cool with us mentioning their name. If you want to post things publicly, the best place to do it is at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com in the comment section under each episode. And if you want to support us, best place to start, whistlekick.com. Look at all the things that we're doing over there. Buy something, share something, review something, or join the Patreon. If you see somebody out there wearing whistlekick stuff, say hello. And if you have any other feedback, well, you know how to get us. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest, your support. We appreciate all of it. And three, two, one, until next time, train hard. Train hard, smile, smile and, and have, have a great, a great day. day.